recycling is too cheap for its own good. You know, a lot of politicians, they want to build a tunnel. You know, I want to build a motorway. You know, this is like sort of this large penis complex, right? This is, like, this is how they think that they've done something. See, I built a motorway. I built a tunnel through that mountain for cars. But you know what, this is, uh, there's much easier ways to do that and uh, much more clever ways to, you know, impress <laughs> future generations. And that's by implementing, you know, um, the bicycle on the urban landscape. <laughs> In Copenhagen, we found out that um, basically for every kilometer cycled in Copenhagen, we put about 75 euro cents in our pocket. And this is a variety of factors involved. Uh, a healthier workforce, you know, uh, people living longer and whatnot. Um, you know, we're just putting money in our pocket. Another study here in Denmark has shown that for every kilometer cycle, the state, the Danish state, puts um, 22 cents in their pocket. Profit, net profit. Um, and for every kilometer driven by car in Denmark, they pay out 16 cents. It's net loss. You have uh, motorists with lifestyle illnesses, heart disease, you know, all of these things. Um, you know, delays in traffic, you know, lost production hours, you know, they're not very healthy, so they call in sick more and whatnot. Cyclists, the people who ride a bike every day don't do that, you know, they have, they're much more healthy. They're more productive, you know. You ease congestion, you ease CO2, you, uh, you know, you reduce pollution. It's, it's like it's a, it's a complete win-win situation. Um, and it's, it basically, it's cost efficient. It pays off. Within five years, you're, you're starting to pay it off. So who do you think has the leadership role as far as bikes are concerned? Do you think it's the Danes or the Dutch? Or? I think both, um, both uh, you know, Denmark and Holland, Copenhagen and Amsterdam have spent 30 years. This grassroots movement, you know, for the bicycle to um, in the 1970s during the oil crisis was the same in both countries. We both sort of started again on the journey towards, you know, establishing bicycle culture about 30 years ago. And now people are knocking on our door constantly here in the world cycling capital. I mean, they want to know how to do it. So we have, you know, I have a company and there's a couple of other companies and sort of consultancies. Um, we're expe exporting our best practice, exporting our experience, you know, but it, it, re it really is, you know, Holland and Denmark are the Romulus and Remus of bicycle culture, you know, there's, there, there's nothing else. Third place is Japan. The leadership role is, is, is definitely, I think the advantage with Copenhagen is that many cities around the world can see them, can see their own city in Copenhagen. Amsterdam has a strange layout, you know, it's very unique. There will never be an Amsterdam somewhere else in the world, but there could possibly be other Copenhagen cities. You know, we have the third largest urban sprawl in Europe. Um, so this is sort of, this you know, appeals to traffic planners from the States and Australia and whatnot. You know, they can associate with the urban sprawl. Of course, they have this problem. Um, so, you know, we, it's, we have that advantage here. But the Dutch are so much better at promoting cycling than the Danes are at the moment in the current climate. Okay, why? Why is that? And they, they, they focus on the positive, you know. For the past couple of years, I've been <clears throat> comparing traffic safety campaigns. You know, every fall, every autumn, there's a, you know, Remember Your Lights campaign. And um, so last year, I compared the Danish one with the Dutch one. And, uh, you know, the Danish one had this, you know, like a skull uh, riding a bike, you know, and basically implying that if you didn't have your lights on, you would die, you know, which is like really not encouraging cycling, you know, this is like brain dead marketing. The Dutch have like a really amusing campaign where um, everybody has their lights, they put their lights on their bags or on their jackets and stuff. And a girl kissing with her boyfriend in the backyard and the dad catches them because they have their lights on. So the slogan was, you know, remember to put on your light, turn on your lights, but remember to turn them off. Yeah, right? turn them off. It's, it's, that's brilliant marketing. That's, you know, selling with humor, that's selling uh, with a positive message, you know, and just, um, they're just world champions at selling cycling positively. They have a bicycle federation, Pizza Bond, which is, you know, this is all they do, selling cycling. Um, here in Denmark, the Bicycle Federation, the DCF, they're, they're, um, they're sort of on all of these negative campaigns, you know, helmet promotion, um, focusing all the neg on, on all the negative things, things that do not sell cycling to the general population, do not encourage people to ride bikes. Helmet laws, bicycle helmet laws, and bicycle helmet promotion are the quite possibly the most ridiculous thing that any anybody can do. Um, we've seen it all over the world, every every region in the world where, uh, where there are helmet laws and where there is intense promotion of bicycle helmets, the number of cyclists drops up to 40% in some regions in Australia since their helmet laws. I mean, the health advantages of, of you know encouraging urban cycling are 20 times greater than any risk involved. The Cyclist Federations in Holland 
France, Germany, the UK, Ireland, Spain, you name it, um, Belgium. You know, this is, we gotta sell cycling because this is a good thing, right? And if you keep flashing pictures of, of, of people wearing helmets, you know, you're just, all you're doing is, is underlining something that isn't actually true, that cycling is dangerous. Yeah, and people stop cycling. I think you heard about Sue Abbott's case in Australia, mm -hmm. and the court, she went to court because she wasn't wearing a helmet. What, what did you think about that? Do you, do you support that idea that she would take the... In Sue Abbott's case in Australia, I mean, you know, just the fact that she actually wanted to fight the, her ticket for riding without a helmet is fantastic, you know, especially in Australia, which, you know, who forced these helmet laws through is feisty. She's, uh, you know, she's bold, and I think that's great. And yeah. she just wants to ride her bike because she wants to see She fit. is, but unfortunately she lost, you know about that, yeah. right? It was the way that she lost which was irritating, which is, and that's why she's appealing, because it really wasn't fair. Um, you know, and she'll probably lose again when she appeals, but hey, you know what, it's creating, you know, focus on the fact that cycling is a good thing for society. You know, there's no, not really a coincidence that since Australia put their helmet laws into effect, they have actually become the world's fattest country. They have more, you know, a higher percentage of obese people in their population than America does. So we're, you know, you can either promote helmets and kill off cycling, or you can promote cycling and extend, you know, the life uh, of, your, of your citizens and, and reap all the, the health benefits. You have the choice. We can't do both. Yeah. Right.